you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, if you know anything about John, John got to write several books in the New Testament for us. He was the beloved disciple. Um, he was the one, as the story goes, was uh, boiled in oil. He was the one who was sentenced to the island of Patmos, where he received the Revelation, which is the final book of Scripture. He was one who walked with Christ, and he is the one who pens these words that we will read this morning. As we have thought about who we are, whose we are, the call to teaching one another in those endeavors from the smallest of us to the oldest of us, I want to invite you to think about the first four verses in First John. And so if you have your place, would you stand and let's read that passage together. John writes this, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So these things we write, so that our joy may be made complete. Father, as we open your word, I pray that you would speak to us this morning, that you would remind us of our identity, even as you remind us of your reality, that you help us to see the relationship that you have given us through Jesus Christ, that that would become more and more the heart's desire, the, the sieve through which we take our thoughts, the reasons why we take our steps. Holy Spirit, would you teach us during this time, speak from your word to your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I've entitled the message, A Parent's Privilege, in light of Mother's Day, in light of our parent dedication service. But in a real sense, there is a spiritual family that we have as well. And so as we think about living out our faith in light of who is watching, whether that be church members, whether that be our neighbors, whether that be a co-worker, maybe that be a fellow student, whether that be someone in your neighborhood. We have opportunity to live out our faith. And John is writing to um, these people, and he is challenging them with different kinds of tests of the faith, that, that they might see that they are in the faith and of the faith. And so he mixes no uh, kind of punches here. He goes right at it. He will give about five, uh, at least five tests of ways that people can consider the gospel and its application to their lives, but he starts from a foundation that he speaks from. And we're going to talk about how our faith impacts others. So the first point I want to bring is this. A personal faith is always shaped by what is personally experienced. A personal faith is shaped by what is personally experienced. Look at verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning this word of life. The extent of your faith, the depth of your faith, the scope of your faith, the influence of your faith, all of these things are affected by the realness and significance 
of your personal encounter with the one at the center of that faith, Christ. Our experience with Christ molds us and molds our convictions concerning him. John was an eyewitness of Christ. For three plus years, he watched this Jesus in person. He heard him speak. He saw him change lives as well as his own. He experienced his touch. On the night that he was betrayed, he even laid his head against his Savior's chest. You see, there was no doubt in John. There was absolute confidence because he had been with Jesus. First John is written as a litmus test for authentic faith. Probe after probe, challenge after challenge, John helps his readers ponder their own faith position because for John, it is clear. You either believe in Christ and on Christ or you don't. And there is a vast difference in its outcomes. He writes at the end of 1 John in chapter 5, verse 11, he says, this is the testimony, or the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He gives us these two things. This is the relationship that you are to have. This is our testimony that we proclaim Even writing his own gospel, the gospel of John, he gets to the end of it and in like manner says these words. There were many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written, why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I want you to notice something here. John is not promoting a religion He is not promoting a set of moral beliefs or a code of conduct. He is promoting a person. He is promoting Jesus Christ. In him is life. We have seen the one, the word of life. So what, or better who, have you experienced in your Christian faith? Maybe you've watched models of the Christian faith as you've grown up. Maybe you've participated in the ministry of the faith. The question is this, have you been a participant in the activity or a participant in the relationship? Have you experienced Christ or have you just experienced church and religion? The question for us is based on our relationship with the Father. You see, because what we have experienced, we share. Look at verses 2 and 3. The life was manifested, we've seen, and so we testify and we proclaim to you. Goes on further, verse 3. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. I got in some trouble recently. My son has asked his girlfriend to be his wife. And in fact, they're here today, right over here. And so they, they let us in on, well, he let me in on all the details. And then we got the call. We came down. We celebrated with them. I waited at least 18 hours before I declared unto Facebook, my son is engaged. To which I got a phone call. Dad, we hadn't told everybody yet. I said, well, I just saved you some time. I waited. I thought that the next day was at least long enough that you'd made all your phone calls. But the reality is, it was because that we love to tell stories that we've experienced. This was something that was important and significant, and I wanted to share the story. We're storytellers. Uh, last night, my sons came home, and they wanted to tell me about their nephew's or their cousin's basketball game. It was, they were down by three, and their cousin had the ball. He heaved a half-court shot, and it just came up short of tying the game. Hit the rim. If it had just been a little harder, it would have been overtime. Lily comes down and tells me a story. She tells me, Dad, I went out looking for snakes. 
I found earthworms instead. And so I took the earthworms and I wanted to feed the chickens, so I stuck them in my hoodie pocket to go feed the chickens. Well, evidently she got distracted. So later on, her papa, who loves fishing, calls her on her phone, to which she instantly realizes, oh, papa likes fishing, fishing, worms, worms are in my pockets. She reaches in and goes, papa, I got worms in my pockets. Cat, newly adopted into the family, coming into the family, getting a taste of what it's going to be like as a Donahue, is laying next to her on the bed when Lily just whips out a bunch of worms out of her pocket. And Cat goes off, ah, screaming, and Lily's laughing her head off and telling me the story. We, we like to tell stories of things that we've experienced, places we have been, things that we have heard, things that we have touched with our hands, literally. So let me ask this question. How often are you sharing moments about when Jesus is involved? When was the last time you shared how God showed up or Jesus revealed something or the Spirit moved in or through you? Monday night, I had the privilege of moderating the NKBA spring meeting. And as a part of that time in that meeting, um, our association has different ministries that we support, that we encourage and we help out with. And so they offer reports during that time. I was struck by the passion and excitement that they had for the things that God was doing. It was good to be there that night. I got to hear how God was moving on NKU's campus, how 20-something Nepalese students who are Hindu went on a a spring break trip with about 20 other NKU BCM students and got to talk about Jesus for a week, and how some of those students have come back willing to say, I'm going to give Jesus a try. They're not saved but they're willing to open up the Bible and start learning. And so they're opening up the Gospel of John, and they're working through that. I got to hear how the Max Center that's located down in Covington, how it's doing ministry, how it's helping families in that community, and how they are seeing people's lives be changed, and how they even had an opportunity um, at an event hosted here back in April to have someone share a testimony of how A simple ministry of that um, more activity center had led to them getting involved and then led to them bringing their family and then led to salvations in their family, totally changing that family's dynamic. I got to hear from Steve Rodriguez, who is the new chaplain as Pavel has moved on to Churchill Downs. He's now the new local chaplain, and I got to hear of his heart for the over 400 people who are working at the track, kids included. And he talked about how his heart was broken for so many things, that there were uh, men who absolutely needed some type of men's ministry, women who needed women's ministry, how there were kids there, and he was trying to brainstorm different ways for them to reach out and to connect and to help. And then be able to tell testimonies of how they've been able to come alongside people in their time of need and be Jesus. I got to hear about a church plant right now that is going on um, among Muslims. There's a local, um, I guess he's from uh, Saudi Arabia somewhere, and he is over here. God has saved him, and he believes he is called to to, uh, plant a church among Muslims in this area. And so he is building in that direction, even as they are trying to uh, build temples and imams and and have all that kind of stuff, he's trying to break in and see God at work, and he's being able to share stories, and the NKBA is partnering with them. It was really cool to hear stories about how Jesus is working and changing lives. And you have here this John who has been impacted Because you see, we have something incredibly wonderful to share. John talks about this as eternal life, this Jesus Christ. There's a relationship with God. 
And John is convinced, and the, the truth is that the more that we grow in the depth and the conviction of our faiths, the more it's going to become the ethos in which we function and the MO for how we operate. The more we're convinced, the more it becomes almost involuntary to proclaim. You just, you have to talk about it because it's what makes you tick. The more passionate you become, the more obvious it is and will be to others. We share our experiences. We're by nature storytellers. And so the question is, are you walking with Jesus in such a way that you have stories to tell and a message to proclaim? John certainly has experienced Jesus, and so he wants to share and proclaim it with these readers. Third thing is this. There is joy when others join in. There is joy when others join in. Picking up the second half of verse 3. So that, we write these things, we proclaim these things, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Our joy is full or complete as we see the gift being passed on to others and they share in it with us in this common joy and relationship with Christ. You see, my kids came home and told me stories because they knew that I would laugh about worms in a pocket. They told me stories about a basketball and admit that just that missed shot because they knew I would be right there with them as they had hoped for their cousin. Those in ministry, those ministry leaders shared their story because they knew talking about Jesus would stir hearts with joy and feet towards service. And in so doing, they were joyful in sharing. John writes this letter so that they can experience the same Savior and the same relationship and fellowship with him. Notice notice what it says so that you too may have fellowship with us. You join in as we have experienced Christ, so you can experience Christ with us and join with us in that life. His joy is for his readers to have fellowship with him in truth. Pastor Eric read the verse earlier, 3 John verse 4, no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. There is great joy. When I was a math teacher, I know it's hard to believe, but a lot of kids didn't like coming into my class. I didn't take it personally. I knew they were just ignorant and needed to be educated in the ways of loving mathematics. And so I would work diligently to show them the beauty of mathematics. And there were times, not a lot, but there were times when they would go, oh, and the light would come on. Do you understand that? That kept me going for like a month and a half. It didn't matter the punk in the back that, you know, gave me a hard time the whole time because this kid up here was like, yes, I am, I'm tracking. You know how much more incredible it is when it's Jesus Christ? when it doesn't just get them an A on a quiz or a test or a homework assignment, but it changes their eternity and puts them in right relationship with their eternal heavenly father now. John's heart was writing so that they would know Jesus because he knew that Jesus changes everything. He had changed his life, raptured his life in such a way that he was willing to be exiled, that he was willing to be boiled, that he was willing to face whatever, and still wrote that they might know him too. I mean, I guess if you had listed all of the, the problems and the issues, sign me up for that, John. Maybe not, but he says, no, it's worth it. Jesus is worth it. Paul did the same thing to the Corinthian church. Yeah, I've been this, I've been that, I've been that, I've been that. Be imitators of me and walk with me. We were reading in our life group this morning, looking at the book of Ephesians, and Paul is in prison, but he says, therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, I urge you 
to walk in a manner worthy. Like, these men knew what the cost was, but they knew what the reward was. And so they were so convinced by it because they had seen, they had touched, they had been able to participate in that they were then able to say to anyone else, there is nothing better than this. A couple applications for this. First one is this. We need to make sure that we have something worth passing on. Parents, those couples that dedicated themselves to raising their children. I am I'm continually frustrated by our willingness to let our kids just try to figure it out on their own. I, I, will, I will tell you what that means to me, and I've said this before, and I will say it again. If I know that my child is about to walk across the street, I don't say, I just hope he figures it out and doesn't get hit. I grab him and yank him back if necessary to keep him safe. Do you understand if you truly believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, then you're going to continue to demonstrate that and promote that in your family. And it is going to guide and direct what you do. And you don't just leave your child up to the wind and waves of the world. You help them understand the world in light of God's truth. You don't let them figure it out on their own. Because what happens when you say, good luck, go try it on your own, you're basically saying, I have something that's worked for me. I hope maybe it'll work for you, but you have to go explore that on your own. Good luck. Hopefully I see you when you come around. See, I don't think that's a good idea. Because at the end of the day, I believe that there is Jesus Christ, and then there is not Jesus Christ. Like, there's only two options, ultimately. And so if I am so convinced that their eternal salvation rests in a knowledge of Jesus Christ and coming to faith and repentance through him and what he has done on the cross, then I continue not in a way that is belligerent, not in a way that is judgmental, but I continue to love them with the gospel and raise them up in a fear and a knowledge of that gospel. But what that means is I have to believe that enough and be convinced of that enough that I hold on to it. So that when they buck against it, I don't shirk back and go, well, maybe, maybe I should give them a little more room. Maybe I should just let them kind of pursue their own ideas. Like, I have to be so convinced that this is truth, that I don't waver, that I represent Jesus Christ to them in a way that is honest and true, loving and gracious, but uncompromising. John calls him the word of life, eternal life. If you are signing your kid up for religion or that moral code or that behavior modification, it will fail. Because we're introducing someone to a person, we're not adding on Jesus. We need to make sure as we are doing this that we have something worth passing on. Because here is something that is true. A parent's convictions are rarely received more enthusiastically by their children. A parent's convictions are are rarely received more enthusiastically by their children. I read in a book, it was talking about CEOs and companies. The initial starters of companies are the passionate ones with the vision. They're the ones that build it off. They have a vision that they are unwavering in casting. And as they develop that vision, people come on board and get excited about it. One of the scariest moments for a company or an organization is when that founder steps aside for the new CEO. Because even though that person may have been grown up in that organization and in that structure, they haven't necessarily battled all the same battles, they haven't faced all the same things, they didn't have the vision maybe as profoundly, and they have to grow into that. And then the question is, will they sustain it? When one person passes on a vision it doesn't get received just automatically at the same level. I, I pour into my kids, but my hope and my prayer is that they have been introduced to Jesus so that Jesus takes them further. 
right? I, I cannot live out my kids' faith for them. I cannot be that one. At some point, they have to embrace that on their own. And so I know that if I am kind of blasé about the whole thing, I'm starting them off even more blasé. If I'm not absolutely convinced and that my life isn't driven by those things, then what they're seeing is a dad who's wishy-washy and they're going, maybe this isn't necessary. And so I recognize that my job is to love Jesus in a way that is passionate. And I will tell you, that isn't always easy because I can be just as easily distracted and taken from those things. And so I have to come back to Scripture. I have to have those things like Rusty just read over us. I have to internalize those truths. I have to be kept fresh so that I'm not just talking, but I'm walking. And so the third application is this. I must stay close to the Savior. If I want to pass something on, I need the warmth of the Savior to pass on warmth. I don't muster it in myself. I don't muster it in my own strength. And so the closer I stay to Jesus, the more I look like Jesus, the more Jesus works through me. And so goal of every person in here who's seeking to be an influencer in the life of someone else, and that would be every one of you because you're on mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. Your mandate is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to stay close. In Deuteronomy, there's this beautiful passage where it talks about that you would cling to me, like cling to me in the midst of this world. John says what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've touched, these things we pass on. Do you have a vibrant faith to be passed on? Because here is the counter of that. If, there's, if there is incongruency or there isn't congruency between action and faith, the reality is our actions impact will win out every time. Another way of saying that is what you do doesn't match what you say. What you do is going to trump. That's why as a youth minister, I would watch kids who would come into the youth ministry, they'd be dropped off by their parents. Parents would go do X, Y, and Z, and they just hoped that somehow I would magically reform their children. And then there would be parents that would drop off their kids, and that great change would happen. But what I know is, I look at the families that they, these two kids were coming from, it wasn't me, it wasn't my ministry, I was actually supporting what was going on at home. And so in a family that they loved the Lord and they were pushing their family towards the Lord, I was basically just helping to expedite that process. I was a catalyst for that, but they were already laying the foundation. But in those families that thought, faith, I need to raise my kid in church, and so I'll just show up, but it's not really mine, and I'm not really living it out. They looked at dad, they looked at the church, and they said, He's not doing what that's saying. He's not that excited about that. He doesn't really see that as important. So I don't need it either. That's how I lived the first probably 17 years of my life. Um, my dad came from a Catholic background, Catholic in basically name only. Uh, we never attended church. My parents divorced when I was young, so every other week I didn't have to go to church. I got out of it every other week. When I had to go, I just kind of sat in the back. I was a balcony person for those back there. Yeah, I waving at you. I would take the, uh, the envelopes in the back of the pews, and I would do the top 25 of the next uh, AP basketball poll while whatever was happening down there was happening because I didn't need it. My dad didn't need it. I didn't need it. One day, God got a hold of me. I'm eternally grateful. What are you passing on? Are you passing on something worth being passed on? Do you know Jesus? Is he the story that you tell? I'm grateful for those things that we 
stated from Scripture about us. But you do realize that you have to have a relationship with Jesus to be able to say those things. And so the question this morning is, are you born again to a living hope? Have you had your sins forgiven? Have you come to Jesus that you would have a story to tell? Or are you just doing religion? Showing up on a Sunday morning because you got to check a box. You got to make mom happy because it's Mother's Day. But it's not really who you are and what you do. It doesn't impact how you live. Let me invite you to come to Jesus because it'll change your life. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for the witness of John. I thank you for the experience that he had so that his life was so radically changed that he would invite anyone and everyone who would listen to join. I thank you for the testimony and the the people who I have watched in my own life as I have seen Jesus change them and for the impact that they've had on my life. But Lord, I'm most grateful that you have worked in me that you've changed me, that I have a relationship with you. And Lord, that isn't an easy thing. That isn't something that I, that I set back and just assume. It is a journey because that's what a relationship is. And I am so grateful that we have begun that journey. I'm so grateful that I can sing, I'm forgiven. I am so grateful that I can declare that I have a living hope. God, help me and help every person in here who has been born again continue to live out and share that story. Keep us close so that we might be a a walking billboard and a constant voice of our Savior's love for us. For those in this room who have not received you as personal Lord and Savior, Father, we ask that you would break through heart and mind And that you would give them a story to tell. That they would see Jesus as a savior, not just of the Bible story. But they would see Jesus as a savior of them. One who loves. One who has come to rescue and redeem. One who has brought people to himself through his death on the cross. Dying in our place. It's in his name that we have gathered. It's in his name that we have worshiped. It's in his name that we have opened up our hearts and minds to receive the word, the word of life. In his name we pray, amen.